How did the Libertarian Party convention become a campaign stop for candidates with wildly anti-libertarian views? This year's speakers included Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who once called for jailing so-called climate deniers, and former President Donald Trump, a rabid opponent of free trade who added $8 trillion to the U.S. debt. It's part of a strategy to transform the LP into a major force in American politics that's largely the brainchild of political strategist Michael Heiss, who viewed the 2016 presidential candidacy of Gary Johnson and Bill Weld as a colossal failure. Gary Johnson, 4.3 million votes, highest vote total ever. No lasting movement, no return on investment on those votes. They didn't stay because they weren't what you might call true believers. They didn't feel it in their bones. You know, it, it didn't have that same animation to it that the Ron Paul thing. You know, why is there no cultural Rand Paul movement that lasts? Why is there no cultural Gary Johnson movement that has lasts? But there is a Ron Paul revolution that lasts to this day. I think we need to learn from that and learn what the implication for, from that is. The primary goal of the new Libertarian Party isn't winning national elections, which Heiss considers delusional, but to leverage its ability to draw enough votes to swing the election. Through its spoiler status, the hope is that the LP can extract concessions and gain influence. This convention was the first major test. Meet the new Libertarian Party. Forty percent of the people in this country can identify a relative that came through Ellis Island. This country was built by immigrants. We are full. America's full. Listen. The change in strategy began when a group called the Mises Caucus took over the leadership of the LP at the 2022 convention in Reno, Nevada. But I will move heaven and earth to make this thing functional and not embarrassing for you. It modeled itself after Ron Paul's presidential campaigns by emphasizing a non-interventionist foreign policy that sets it apart from both major parties, as the podcast host Dave Smith told Reason. The priorities of the Mises Caucus have always been Basically, the priorities of the Ron Paul revolution, which were being anti-war, being uh, sound Austrian economics. The new LP invited in social conservatives by removing abortion rights from the party platform and attempting to do the same with open immigration. And when you put open borders plus pro-abortion in there, again, it kind of forms a cultural hegemony. Uh, for one side that might not be indicative of the wider libertarian movement. This alienated libertarians who view social freedoms as core to the political philosophy, as did the LP's brazen new approach to social media, such as when the New Hampshire LP gloried in a photo of Meghan McCain crying over her father's casket. The Mises Caucus leadership vowed to clean up its messaging and grow the party's membership and fundraising to unprecedented levels. By our fruits you'll know us. Internal documents show that candidates, fundraising, and membership have plummeted since the takeover, and state affiliates have continued their online provocation. But supporters predicted in 2024, we'd see a turnaround. Now I think you should nominate me or at least vote for me, and we should win together. How do you think things are going for the LP? Um, I mean, things are never really going good for the LP. You know what I mean? That's what we do. We're here, we lose. That's what, that's what libertarians do, all of us. How do you think things are going relatively since the takeover that happened at Reno? Um, I think there's been, there's been progress in a lot of ways. There's been challenges in a lot of ways. I think um, running a third party is not easy, and especially when all of the rules are, are stacked against you. And then we've also had to... Uh, deal with, let's say, a very hostile uh, environment from many other self-described libertarians, including uh, pieces like this. It's been, it's been very eye-opening to me to see over the last few years how vicious like some of the, the smears that are launched at us are. Um, and I was very unhappy with, uh, with Brian Darty particularly for the piece he ran about us in, uh, in Reno. Um, Why is and, that? What was the problem? Oh, it's just the constant insinuations that like we're some type of 
Ku Klux Klan type okay. group, yeah. which is very bizarre to me. Uh -huh. um, I'm like a Jewish kid from Brooklyn, and I would guarantee I have more black friends than everybody who works at Reason Magazine. <laughs> um, so it's just like a very weird kind I mean, of are like you thing. Bother, I guess the pe people are bothered by some of the social media messaging. I think that's what a lot of it boils down to. A lot of stuff that comes out of the state affiliates. There has been stuff that's been like borderline anti-Semitic. Like, does does that bother well, what, you? What, is there any way to... Well, what was borderline anti-Semitic? There was one that came out of Michigan where it was like, uh, you know, a um, like Hasidic Jew or something holding like puppets of the Democrats and the Republicans. It's like, I don't know, that looks very much like the yeah, Jews that, are puppet masters. Yeah, that's a, that's probably a stupid tweet. Yeah. But I think the comment there was clearly, at least the my guess is the attempt is to say that like, the like Israel's influence over U.S. foreign policy, yeah. which is pretty undeniable, right? I get you that. just talked to Thomas Massey, yeah. who had it, a foreign uh, lobby putting millions of dollars into his to primary him, yeah. and thankfully failed. But so, if you have a situation like that, what is it? We're not allowed to make the comment that like, hey, this foreign nation seems to have some control. I, I over think you're allowed us. to make the comment. It's more the way that you make the comment, sure. uh, the way that it's interpreted, and then these are. Often the tweets that end up going viral because everyone's like, "Look at what the yeah. libertarians are all about now," and that's well, what think, gets people uncomfortable. I get, I get your point, yeah. and we, the truth is that we probably, we probably agree on one hundred percent of the tweets that you would be like, "Oh, that's that's not the way it should have been said." Right. But I also recognize that it's like. And I feel some ownership over this because a lot of these are like my guys. What do you think about Trump being here? It's interesting. I'm very interested to see how how it's going to go. It's uh, I think it's there's there's uh, the the analogy that I used on my podcast was I was like it's throwing the ball downfield. Like if you're a football fan, it's like we're definitely going for it. This convention represents kind of something that never would have happened under the old guard, where we're making attempts to kind of be involved in the broader political conversation. Um, so I think that's very valuable. A prime example of that kind of outreach was the presence of former GOP presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, who made the case for libertarians to ally with Republicans to support Trump. Why are you here at the Libertarian National Convention? Well, I was invited to speak, and I believe that the future of the country is going to be an alliance between the libertarian nationalist movement in this country. Why would libertarians ally with nationalists? What do they have to do with each other? Yes, so I think that they're not that they're non overlapping objectives, but they're not in tension with one another, and I think that's what we got to see. So when I say nationalist, I mean a revival of our national identity, answering who we are as Americans and taking pride in it. I don't think that's counter to libertarian principles at all. I think we've lost that national pride and identity in our country, and I think that is a foundational issue. Kentucky Republican House member Thomas Massey, a favorite of libertarians for his opposition to COVID lockdowns, regulation, the Federal Reserve, and debt-financed federal spending, also attended the convention for a day. And I think the Libertarian Party is really smart to invite other people uh, to their convention. It's, it's going to be probably one of the closest watched libertarian conventions in years. Why is that smart? Politics is about messaging, and you got to get your message out. And if you don't have an audience, uh, you can you can preach to an empty room. But I mean, this will be a chance for I think libertarians to give feedback to President Trump and to RFK Jr. A few years ago, the Libertarian Party was kind of openly hostile toward me, and I'm the most libertarian-leaning member of Congress. I don't claim to be a libertarian. I know I can never live up to these standards, but um, it, I always wondered, why are, why are they mad at me? I'm like the guy who's trying to advance a lot of these principles, especially you know the ones that overlap with the Republican Party platform. Um, so I like the change, just the fact that I've been invited to this is a big change. And we've seen um, people try to pretend like Angela McArdle hasn't done something very, very damn near impossible, um, even at this convention. And so they take their ball and they go home instead of saying, hey, we lost this one, but we got a bigger enemy outside. Maj Ture is the founder of Black Guns Matter and a Mises Caucus supporter. You're about to change America. So you think that's a good thing that Trump is here at the convention? I, th I think everything is a gray area. It's not good until we get through it. I think that the visibility of it is going to be great for the Libertarian Party if we can maintain what our principles are instead of leaning towards what some of the people that will come to the convention to see Trump speak 
Um, if w you got to be careful. Sometimes you dance with the devil, the devil changes you, you don't change the devil. The Mises Caucus's favorite presidential candidate was Michael Rechtenwald, a former self-described Marxist college professor and author of The Great Reset and The Struggle for Liberty. Oh, I spoke around the country uh, detailing and arguing against the COVID totalitarianism under which we suffer. He views politics through a populist lens, whereby elites seek total control over the population by leveraging or even creating crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic to achieve such ends. Great question. So I'm the only candidate in the race that's actually talked to the about the other threats, new threats to liberty that we face. Uh, Agenda 2030, uh, the climate tyranny, mm -hmm. climate uh, change tyranny, and uh, the, what, what's been called the Great Reset, which is really just the project of the World Economic Forum and the UN uh, to institute this new stakeholder capitalism model and to control and regulate the population through all kinds of climate change uh, regulations and uh, restrictions. It's a similar message to that of RFK Jr., who threw himself into the ring for the Libertarian Party nomination at the last minute. Tens of millions of Americans are waking up to the fact that they were lied to, to the fact that they were manipulated, that they were gaslit, except for a narrow elite that's still promoting it, mainly in the media. Americans have lost all trust in our public institutions. You know... I'm standing in this video from California this morning to let you know that I accept this unexpected honor. I've always admired the Libertarian Party. I have a deep alignment with the core values. Although Trump was ineligible to seek the party nomination because of a GOP ban on running with multiple parties, that didn't stop him from opening his headline speech by proclaiming himself a libertarian and asking for the party nomination to a chorus of boos. If I wasn't a libertarian before, I sure as hell am a libertarian now. Much of my record is libertarian. DeRoy Murdoch wrote an article yesterday in which he mentions just some of the things that make me a libertarian without even trying to be one. That's nice. The Libertarian Party should nominate Trump for President of the United States. Whoa. That's nice. Only if you want to win. Only if you want to win. Maybe you don't want to win. Maybe you don't want to win. Keep getting you 3% every four years. Trump did garner some applause later in the speech when he began to address some of the LP's demands. He promised to commute the life sentence of Ross Ulbricht, the founder of the black market website The Silk Road. And if you vote for me on day one, I will commute the sentence of Ross Ulbricht to a sentence of time, sir. Trump also offered to appoint a libertarian to his cabinet in exchange for the party's endorsement and to protect Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies from federal regulation. That is why I'm committing to you tonight that I will put a libertarian in my cabinet and also libertarians in senior posts. I will ensure that the future of crypto and the future of Bitcoin will be made in the USA, not driven overseas. I will support the right to self-custody to the nation's 50 million crypto holders. I say this with your vote. I will keep Elizabeth Warren and her goons away from your Bitcoin. Post-speech, three presidential nominees delivered a response, but most of the crowd and media had cleared out by then. Rechtenwald walked out in the middle of the post-speech press conference and later admitted he was high on a gummy edible. I really think this is getting redundant and I'm not interested in carrying out an all night uh, Ronald, uh, Donald Trump roast. It's just a little bit boring. And uh, I, I, I'm just not, this is not something I want to keep participating on. You can, you can opt out, We're it's a voluntary move. What did you think of Trump's speech? It was fun watching 
him speak and everybody's reaction, it was kind of what I expected. You know, he'd get a few cheers, some people would really boo him. Um, I give anyone credit who's willing to go in a place they're not really wanted and deal with the boos and talk to people. I don't feel like he brought his A game. I feel like uh, it was a slog and he got through it. Uh, we got through it. <laughs> that room was the weirdest room I have ever been in. What did you think of the crowd's reaction to President Trump? I think that they want to hold elected leaders accountable, yeah. and, and I can appreciate that. Do you think that there is common ground between MAGA and libertarians? Well, when you ask libertarians, 10 libertarians, what they believe, you get 10 different answers. So I'm sure not all libertarians, but uh, there's definitely some crossover and some opportunities. It has been a positive experience overall. Um, I've been spoken to by multiple reporters from other countries. Uh, the media coverage has been great. And they, are, they all ask me, what is free Ross? And uh, it, it, I think it's a big deal. Are you glad he came? I like the exposure to the Libertarian Party. I think uh, that's super valuable. Uh, I think it was a valuable thing for him to uh, to get to experience a crowd like us, where we're not completely bought in to, to his bullshit. Uh, and we know that when he says Joe Biden, you know, and invented all this inflation, it's like, no, man, like you started this. I think this convention, and especially over the last couple of years, just from what I've noticed in the party, uh, being involved with it, is just that. Uh, we get talked about a lot more now. Does that convince you to vote for him? Uh, absolutely not. And what about you? Are you ready to vote for Trump? No. Are you going to vote for Trump now? No. No. For McArdle, the media attention and the fundraising from Trump's appearance constituted a major vindication of her strategy. We have stopped the bleed, the churn of uh, expiring membership, and everything is starting to get better. Financially, membership, media, the whole thing is starting to get better. It's taken two years of work, but we're there. The Mises Caucus has adopted a strategy of using the Libertarian Party's spoiler status as a bargaining chip. With Smith's encouragement, their Arizona senatorial candidate dropped out and endorsed the Republican, Blake Masters, who once said libertarianism doesn't work in a special election, on the grounds that he was the lesser of two evils. Masters lost the race anyway. It seems like part of the strategy is you're kind of trying to use the party's potential spoiler status as like a bargaining chip. And you, they explicitly did that in Arizona by dropping out and endorsing Blake Masters. Is that something we should expect to see in 2024 with this outreach to the Trump campaign? Any, in None any of, this? of our candidates have expressed a desire to drop out of the race and endorse anyone. That is not a decision that is up to me. And in Arizona, that decision wasn't up to me. And it was a very difficult PR hurdle to overcome at the national level because we were out of sync on that. But the next day, a central pillar of the Mises Caucus's professed strategy would crumble beneath them. I please implore you guys to support Michael Rechtenwald for President of the United States of America on the Libertarian Party ticket. Thank you all so much. I love you guys. Thank you. In a surprising twist for a party controlled by the Mises Caucus, which had just re-elected McArdle as chair the previous day, Michael Rechtenwald was knocked out after six rounds of voting, leaving Chase Oliver as the last remaining candidate. Oliver, who rose to prominence within the party after forcing a crucial Georgia Senate race to a runoff in 2022 by drawing 2% of the vote, had clashed with candidates from the Mises Caucus faction over immigration during the debate. So yes or no, open borders or not? A border that allows anybody to yes move Yes or through. no, open borders or not? Do you want to build a wall? I don't want to build a wall. I don't want to build domain. a wall, but it sounds like you want an open border. Which is it? Yes uh, or no? A border where people who are peaceful can freely move. Is that yes. a yes? Is that, is yes, that in a no? line with our plank of our party, yes. I support the free movement of people, goods, and capital free across borders. Yes. In the final round of voting, Mises Caucus members attempted to whip votes for NOTA, or none of the above, to ensure the party ran no candidate this year but Oliver won with 60% of the vote. Since then, Smith and several other Mises Caucus members have made clear that they will not vote for Oliver, whom they believe didn't do enough to resist COVID-19 restrictions. Oliver concedes that the pre-Reno Reset Libertarian Party should have opposed lockdowns and government vaccine mandates, both of which he publicly opposed, 
more vociferously. You know, I could say that uh, there has been instances during COVID when we maybe erred on the personal responsibility side as opposed to the fighting mandate and lockdown side. We should have been maybe a bit more uh, forceful there. But if we look at messaging, we have to have professional messaging. My message is pretty simple to those voters out there who have not heard from a libertarian. It's that if you're not committing force, fraud, coercion, theft, or violence, if you're just living in peace, your life is your life, your body is your body, your property is your property, and your business is your business. It will never be mine, and it should never be the government's. And I think that is a message that can resonate with so many young people who are tired of picking one or the other. Oliver's victory complicates the Mises Caucus's strategy. They control the leadership positions, but not the face of the party. Following his nomination, Oliver was attacked online by Mises Caucus members and Trump supporters for his alleged weakness on COVID policy, his views that parents and not the state should decide whether puberty blockers can be prescribed to minors, and that Oliver, who was openly gay, had appeared at Pride events holding a rainbow flag. McArdle responded a week after the convention by hosting a live stream with rainbow imagery and donning a red clown nose. She gave Oliver the party's official endorsement and pledged to help him, mostly in blue states, where he'd be more likely to take votes from Biden. People think I'm going to endorse Donald Trump. Well, I'm not. Get in, loser. We are stopping Biden. And one of the best ways to do that is to support Chase Oliver and go hard in the pain for him in blue states. I know, I know, it's like a total clown show thing. Well, I'm 100% here for that clown show. We gotta do it. it it's, we, we gotta do it to get Ross free. The Libertarian Party grabbed attention and obtained promises from Trump. But if elected, will he follow through? Can a Libertarian Party so deeply divided on questions of strategy and ideology make a difference? What would success look like for the Libertarian Party in 2024? Well, you know, there's that ultimate victory of winning the White House, but short of that ultimate victory, there's a lot of other things we can look to. How many states can we win or secure ballot access that makes it easier for Libertarians to get on the ballot and make voters, the casual voter, comfortable with seeing Libertarians? How many states can we earn major party status that gets us access to the primary ballot or additional media coverage that we wouldn't have had otherwise? How many local electable races can I, as the presidential candidate, get out there, knock on doors, get some fundraising into, push them across the finish line? But I think the most important thing that we need to do as a party to build our foundation up is I want to double our party's membership and hold it for the next four years. Every presidential election year, we get this huge influx of new members and they drop off. I'm not leaving in November. I'm going to stay deeply involved in the party and making sure that every voter who said they're interested in Chase gets interested in the Libertarian Party in their neighborhood.